Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, my name is Kristen Torrey, and I'm the director of Greek Life. Uh, we, and I'm pleased to have members of my team and also some of the wonderful student leaders that I work with here today to help us um, deliver this parent and family webinar. Um, I will toss it over to Destiny to introduce herself and then each of the student leaders to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Destiny Savage. I am the Assistant Director of Greek Life in our office here. I use she, her, hers pronouns and I'm excited to spend some time with y'all this morning. I will pass it over to Jack. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Jack Bukovnik. Um, I'm a senior undergraduate here at Vanderbilt and I'm president of the Interfraternity Council and I use he, him, his pronouns and I'll pass it over to Madison. Hi everyone, my name is Madison Clark and I'm a senior at Vanderbilt. I am the president of the Panhellenic Council and I use she, her pronouns. I'll toss it over to Kayla. Hi everyone, my name is Kayla. I'm also a senior here at Vanderbilt and I use she, her, her pronouns. And I'm the president of the National Panhellenic Council. So we're here today to give a brief overview of our fraternity and sorority community. And we know that probably the majority of the participants on this call today are the parents and family members of first year students or potentially some transfer students um, as the questions that we received were primarily about the joining process. So that we'll spend some time talking about that today. Um, what is Greek life at Vanderbilt? Our fraternities and sororities are groups of students who work um, collectively together, um, thinking about values of siblinghood, academic success, service, and personal and professional development. It's really the role that our fraternity and sorority community plays on campus is about relationships that foster a sense of belonging. That's really one of the most important things that fraternities and sororities do on our campus is really making space for students to feel like they have a home away from home and a place where they can belong um, being their authentic selves. Uh, we have six community priorities in our Greek community and they are diversity, equity, and inclusion, creating spaces of belonging, community and civic engagement, sexual misconduct prevention, health and wellness, and personal and professional development. So we have a set of uh, both goals and action steps that are aligned with these six priorities that both our office and our chapters and our governing councils all work towards throughout the year. And so you would hear your student talk about potentially different things that all align in these community priorities that align with um, both the student affairs and broader university mission and vision about how kind of we're working towards those things. Uh, we have a Greek member experience. So this helps to outline for outline for our students what are the expectations about being a member of our, our, of our fraternity and sorority community. There are four components of those. Two of them are directed by their individual chapters that they might join. One is a community impact initiative that uh, includes things like their service initiatives, um, philanthropic, like how they're giving money or contributing to a local food bank or things like that, or advocacy and education initiatives. The second chapter component is the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. So they might work on a project or program that their chapter has decided about how they want to contribute. Um, and then individual components are their, their membership in their fraternity and sorority can't be the only thing that they're doing on campus. So they are also expected to participate in at least one other student organization on campus. In addition, we are in working in collaboration with this, uh, the Vanderbilt Career Center, and all of our students are engaged in what's called Bandy Pass, and these are connected to eight career competencies, and our students being expected to earn at least 300 points throughout the year in um, these eight competencies that are tech, uh, connected to what they will do after they're done being a member, uh, being a student on our campus. And so what they're going to do in graduate school or for a career after they're done here. And so really trying to make sure that their Greek experience, but their collective Vanderbilt students as a whole are trying to make sure that they're prepared for what's next. So we included some things on the slide here about why would somebody want to join? And so these are some quotes from what some of our members have said. And so we have a lot of reasons why students join at Vanderbilt. And um, so I think what some of the ones that stick out to me the most here are really about, I, you know, the student who said, I'm so lucky to have such amazing sisters who support, uplift, and motivate me to be the best human and leader that I can be. Um, you can see a lot of things on here that are, are about feeling a sense of community and support and love, um, but also helping them to uh, be connected elsewhere on campus and how they can really make an impact um, for 
different, uh, the ways that they are engaged collectively um, as a group, but also as individuals. Uh, so a student that said, I was able to advocate for all black students, not just black students in Greek life and asking for a seat at the table. And so students being able to use their voices and learning to um, develop and, and grow in that way to uh, find spaces for themselves, um, not just within the Greek community, but also outside of that. Um, we wanted to outline some of the basic expectations really specific for both new members, active members, and also um, the, the leaders in our community. That was a specific question that we got um, from some of the parents in advance. So when a student joins our fraternity and sorority community, um, they will participate depending on the council and chapter of which they join, typically a six to eight week new member education program. Um, they will also participate in the Greek member experience, which I just talked about. They will also um, participate in our Ignite VU core educational sessions, um, which is a part of our cultural competency building program. And they um, spent their four core educational sessions that they will do. They participate in an online bystander intervention training and an online risk management module and other chapter specific initiatives. So there might be uh, new member bonding events. Um, they might have a retreat, things like that, that are going to be a part of that um, that new member uh, integration experience um, once they join. As an active member, they will also need to participate um, in the Greek member experience. They participate in a bystander intervention tactics training. They will have weekly chapter meetings and service and philanthropy, service and philanthropy events. And that's a lot of programming and things like that they would be uh, responsible for participating in. If you have a student who chooses to become a leader in the community, um, you can see on here, there's a number of other things in addition to the things that they would do as just a general active member. They have a lot of other um, trainings and community-wide meetings and uh, uh, interactions with our staff and, uh, and other student leaders uh, that they would participate in. So um, depending upon the level of engagement, like a lot of things on campus, students are going to get out of it what they put into it. And so uh, we we want to encourage students to engage at a level that feels right for them. Um, obviously, the three students who are on this call today are, are our three council presidents, so they're engaged at really the highest level. Um, but there's a lot of different options for engagement about how students want to participate in a way that feels good for them. Um, so we're going to have our students talk a little bit now about the um, the the community and give some overviews of their councils and also of uh, what the recruitment process is like after we talk about this that I think Destiny. Yes. Yes. Okay. So as Kristen mentioned, I know many of you all are on our call today to learn a little bit more about our intake or recruitment processes. And so intake and recruitment is the process of pursuing membership into a fraternity or sorority on our campus. Intake refers to the processes that our Intercultural Greek Council and National Panhellenic Council um, students in pursuit of membership participate in and our IFC and Panhellenic students, so Interfraternity Council and Panhellenic Council students participate in a recruitment process. Across all councils, students have to have these criteria in order to be eligible. So first of all, they have to have achieved at least a 2.5 cumulative GPA and have completed at least 12 credit hours. As you'll note here on our slide, Vanderbilt participates in a deferred joining process, meaning that students have to have completed at least one semester of college prior to pursuing membership into any of our organizations. That is a model that we actually really enjoy because we want to make sure that our students learn how to be college students students first and start to form community in their residence halls and in their classes prior to then taking on fraternity or sorority membership because that can be very time consuming and be difficult to balance especially when students are trying to navigate a new environment, whether that be coming to college for the first time or coming to Vanderbilt as a transfer student. And so in addition to those two criteria, also students may not be on disciplinary probation at any point during their joining journey. And so our office reviews that information um, on a regular basis to make sure that our students are not currently on that status with the university. And then finally, across all council students must attend 
present a Project Safe Center consent education session. So our Project Safe Center, for those folks who are not aware, uh, is our center on campus that deals with sexual misconduct prevention education and advocacy work. And so we have a really great partnership with them, and they provide these sessions to all potential fraternity and sorority members. We provide a host of those over the course of the fall semester, and we'll have one makeup opportunity for any students who maybe decide a little later on in the fall that they are interested in recruitment but have missed all the sessions that are prior. Um, and then finally, for any folks pursuing membership into IGC or MPHC, they also must complete an intake seminar. Those, again, are hosted throughout the course of the semester. A really easy way to satisfy that requirement is to attend either the IGC informational session or a Greek mystique for MPHC that happened a little bit earlier this semester. But also, again, there have been multiple intake session requirement opportunities for folks to meet that as well. And then we will now move into talking a little bit about the different councils that make up our community. Is there any Greek council? This council is actually a really great opportunity for students who are looking to join a culturally based organization that's not specifically tied to African-American or Black heritage. Um, the two organizations that we currently have on our campus are Alpha Psi Lambda National Incorporated, as you can see photographed here, and they are currently working with Kappa Delta Chi Sorority and pursuing an expansion. And this council is one of our councils that we would really love to see some more student interest in, in terms of folks who want to have a specific Greek experience tied to cultural heritage. And so I I want to start out by saying to you that in order to join either of these organizations or any organization that comes into Intergreek Cultural Council in the future, or excuse me, Intercultural Greek Council in the future, you do not necessarily need to identify as having that cultural heritage yourself, but have an understanding that that cultural heritage will be centered in the experiences of students in that organization or those organizations. And so that, again, is an opportunity where we're really looking for some growth to happen in our community. Awesome. So I'll spend some time talking about the Interfraternity Council and kind of our joining process as well right there. So uh, we currently have 13 chapters on campus. Um, you can see a list of those on the left, and then you can see uh, our IFC leaders on the right right there. And then uh, so a lot of the kind of questions ahead of time were centered around what IFC recruitment and kind of that process looks like, both for uh, transfer students, upperclassmen and uh, first years. So the way IFC recruitment works is that there's two main cycles. We have a cycle in the fall, and that is for transfer students and upper class, uh, upper class students. Um, and that's a process that goes for a few weeks in the fall. And then those students end up joining towards the end of September. Uh, for first year students, that's a process where those students join in the spring. And the way IFC recruitment generally works is as an informal process. So there's some open events and there's some invitational events throughout the fall semester that students are able to attend uh, to ultimately uh, join in the spring there. So we have uh, final selections and bids offered uh, for first year students or for those upper class students who have chosen to wait and join in the spring. Um, I think one point I wanted to touch on, too, that was a question was asked is about the idea of bids and kind of how that's offered. Um, the way, um, bids are only offered in this uh, in January at that time. Um, students may think they have bids or students may um, you think they have a good relationship with a chapter. But the way our final selection works is we have a bid day in January where everyone is offered bids and membership to a chapter. And then from there, they're able to join. Uh, the one exception to that might be is that some chapters also are going to continue to recruit and offer bids throughout the spring semester. So all chapters are actively recruiting until this early January date. And then throughout the spring as well, we'll have a number of chapters um, looking to add more members throughout that time as well. So one thing I'll say to parents as well, too, is that um, while we're while we're coming towards the end of that spring recruitment process, um, it's certainly not too late in the sense that some chapters are also still recruiting throughout the spring. So um, if your child is still just starting to get into the interfraternity council recruitment process, they have the opportunity to join a chapter during the spring for those still actively recruiting. Or if not, like I myself did, they can come back in the fall 
and join as an upperclassman as well. So there's plenty of times to join an IFC chapter and there's almost continuous cycles and opportunities to join. So um, yeah, that's a broad overview of what IFC recruitment looks like. Hello everyone, now I'll be talking about the National Panhellenic Council. Currently we have eight out of the nine organizations chartered on our campus and you can see all of our leaders there to the right. And then talking a little bit about our recruitment process, there is a designated intake window each semester that lasts about six weeks. And like Destiny and Kirsten um, talked about earlier, we must attend an intake seminar which normally takes the form of Greek mystique um, around August, early September, which is an informal way to meet all eight chapters at one time and really just learn about what MPHC is and what that looks like on our campus. But if you do miss Greek mystique, then there are continuous opportunities throughout the fall and spring to make sure that you do get that requirement taken care of and that you're able to learn more about our community. But each chapter has an individualized process for each organization that's stipulated by their national organization. So it won't be the same throughout all eight chapters. Um, there will be varying lengths of time and the type of process that you would have to undergo to um, obtain membership into certain chapters. So doing your research and really practicing discretion is important throughout um, our entire community, but attending and informational to learn about specific organizations applications will be held by each chapter if they do decide to pursue intake for that semester. So you will your child will have the opportunity to learn about the specific requirements for the chapter they are looking to join. All right, so now I'll talk a little bit about the Panhellenic Council. The Panhellenic Council serves as the unifying governing body for all of its member organizations. At this time, we have nine chapters on our campus, which you can see here, and then you can see my lovely Panhellenic Council and our chapter presidents on the other side of the screen. Um, talking a little bit more specific about recruitment, for the transition, there we go. Um, we have two kind of processes in Panhellenic. We have the informal process, which is continuous open bidding, which takes place in the fall for some chapters for transfer and upperclassmen students to participate in. And so no freshman can join in the fall as we are a deferred recruiting campus. And then we have formal recruitment, which takes place in January for first year students, transfers, and any upperclassmen students who want to pursue that later during their college career. Um, this is a highly structured process. It is not informal like some of the other processes. Um, and it emphasizes mutual selection between chapters and potential new members. Um, something that is really key to advise your child throughout this process is to keep an open mind. Um, all of our chapters are great and have their own unique strengths and really being excited about any chapter throughout recruitment is going to be like, make it a much more fun experience. Um, Something a little bit different for us compared to other SEC schools is it's not common for parents to attend bid day activities unless they're serving in an official role for like their specific chapter if they have participated in Greek life previously. So no reason to book a flight in January unless you have like extenuating circumstances there. Sorry, I might have moved that slide too fast. Madison or Destiny, if there's anything else that you want to say about Panhellenic recruitment, about the selection process or anything before you go into this slide, I welcome that. I, I, I was good on my end, but. Wonderful. Thank you, Madison. So in talking about the financial obligation, there is a financial commitment that students have to make when they are joining a sorority or fraternity on our campus. And finances cover a lot of different things and look very differently by council. So some of our councils have a more or heavier upfront cost and then fairly minimal cost um, throughout the rest of their membership, whereas other organizations still have a higher initial cost and then a sizable cost moving after that initial semester of membership, um, but not as high as that initial cost. And so we have all of those fees broken down for you all on our Greek Life website, um, which has been shared in the Q&A that I think everyone should be able to access. But if not, we will make sure to include that in any notes and follow up. Um, we have fees tied to membership in our organizations because these fees cover essentially the operating budgets for all of our organizations. And so any type of programming that they're doing, if an organization is housed, um, fees for support from their headquarters, all of the local dues fees that members are paying are being spent 
very fiscally responsibly, but in a lot of different ways. And so that's something that we always want to share up front. There is dues assistance available. Um, and that looks again a little bit differently by council. And so our interfraternity council and panelonic councils have dues scholarships that they are able to provide on a semesterly basis. Um, folks apply and then they are chosen through um, various a variety of different um, systems in order to be selected for those applicate for those scholarships. Those are not guaranteed to everyone. So that's always something that we want to note. Um, every organization, however, does have payment plan options available for folks. So if they're unable to pay the full cost at one time, there's a way that organizations can work with individual members to break that cost down into more manageable bites. So when I was a student, that was something that I took advantage of. Instead of paying the full $1,000 in August, I was able to break up those payments into $250 segments over the course of that semester. So that it was more manageable for me because I was self-funding my dues. And we know that many of you may be able to help your students, but also many of you may not be able to help your students. And so we want to make sure that we're providing all of those options um, up front for folks. In addition, if we have any students that you all um, are tied to who are eligible for need-based aid, they can also apply for experienced Vanderbilt funds to utilize for joining a fraternity or sorority or for continuing membership. The really important thing to note about experienced Vanderbilt is that it's only um, available one time per year. So once your student applies that time per year, that is the only time that they'll be able to, unlike the Panhellenic and IFC due scholarships that are available for application each semester, Experience Vanderbilt is only eligible to be applied for once per year. And that total cost can be provided up to $500 for anyone who's interested in joining a fraternity or sorority even if they aren't a member yet. So if they do receive experience Vanderbilt funds and want to use those funds for membership dues in an organization that they are not a part of yet, they are able to do so to help um, kind of subsidize those costs that come along with being a member of a fraternity or sorority on our campus. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to discuss and talk about was related to hazing. Um, both Vanderbilt and Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, well, the state of Tennessee has a law about it, uh, not a policy, I suppose is how I should phrase that. Um, uh, but Vanderbilt has a, a policies in our student handbook that relate to hazing. And we also do a great deal of training and education with our new member educators and chapter presidents and intake chairs and students about what are the expectations related to how all of our new members and anyone who's participating in a process uh, need to be treated with respect and dignity and hazing should not be a part of any of the processes that we have at Vanderbilt University. Um, now, we have had chapters who needed to be removed from our community for engaging in hazing related behaviors. So, I would never look at a group of parents and tell them that I know exactly what the experience will be for anyone um, on our campus at any time. I will tell you that I have worked at Vanderbilt for 21 years, and some of the stories uh, that you see on the news or the majority of things that you might see or um, have great concern about associated with uh, the, some of the hazing things that you see on TV um, or at some of the other campuses are not the kinds of things that we have needed to address on our campus, luckily. Um, uh, so I do think that our students have been very proactive in the way that they, as leaders, have chosen to address and take a stand on why that is not something that they want to accept in our community. So I say that because I think it's important for parents to understand that it isn't something that's just like, um, well, because it's in the handbook or because there is a rule or um, an expectation about this from the Office of Greek Life or from student accountability, that that's why students um, don't want to engage in the behavior. I think there's also things that are about our student population and the way that they want to exhibit care and concern towards one another, that that is why um, the uh, we have the kind of community that we do here. There are a variety of reporting methods. Um, if there are any concerns that you do have 
about what is happening related to um, your child's experience. We have an online reporting form that anyone can use. Students, faculty members, parents, anyone. They can go online. Uh, it's available on our website, on the Student Accountability website. We train the RAs about it. Um, and then that students can go in and or anyone can go in and fill out any concerns that they may have about what um, what is taking place. We also have a hazing hotline. Um, the hazing hotline is not answered by anyone. So it's not like you call it and then like someone answers the phone. It is a message based system where somebody might leave um, a concern about what is happening, but they choose to leave a message instead of the online form. Typically, the online form is what people use instead of the hotline, but um, it, the, the hazing hotline is, is um, available. In, within the IFC, um, the IFC has new member advocates, which are specific men within the chapters that um, are utilized for the new members to identify and say, I'm going to go to this person if I have any concerns about what is going on. So I will give you an example. Um, we had a situation, this was a number of years ago now, but um, uh, Senior Steve had asked um, one of the new members to come over and clean his off-campus apartment. He had a big chemistry test the next day, but also knew that that was not an acceptable thing for him to be doing. He let the new member advocate from his chapter know that this request had been made. The chapter then addressed that behavior with the senior who had made the request. He was not at, to, allowed to participate in any more new member education activities for the rest of the semester. And he was also not allowed to attend social events for the next month. And that was how they addressed like internally to their organization, they communicated with us and told us what happened and like reported it, but they addressed that in a meaningful way, I thought with that brother and the new member knew that he had the power to be able to say, this is why I'm not gonna engage in this behavior with like this this brother who's made this request of me. Um, which I thought was a good example of the new member advocates in action. People also call um, when needed to ask questions about any things that are going on to our office directly. Um, so they just will call our office um, and, and we can help talk through any concerns that they might have and how they might best approach that with their student and with their chapter. It is really important that parents are partners in addressing any concerns they might have. Um, sometimes you'll have a parent who will call and will say, I'm concerned about this, and they won't tell us the name of the child, the name of the organization, or anything that is going on. It's very difficult to address um, behaviors in any meaningful way if we do not know like any of the specifics. So we would really hope for you to be a partner in that, but also to be a partner in having a meaningful conversation with your students um, about what um, they are they're joining an organization for belonging. Um, and so wanting to make sure that um, that they do that in the right way and and how what expectations you want to talk with them about how they might want uh, just want to get engaged in that in the right way. Um, I do want to communicate that we have uh, two groups that are no longer recognized on our campus. Um, they have been suspended within the last couple of years. Um, not actually for, well, one was was suspended for some of the hazing related behaviors that was Delta Kappa Epsilon. Um, and the other is Sigma Chi. Sigma Chi was not suspended for hazing related behaviors. They were suspended for a series of risk management related violations. If your student is talking at all about joining these groups, these groups are not recognized by the university and they are not, they are not groups that we would support participation in. Um, uh, as they are no longer recognized by the university. We will send, we can send out the slides as that was a request from one of the comments um, in the questions um, and make sure that you can, you, and you can also find the list of recognized fraternities on our website. And those would be the ones that we would in, um, encourage participation. Um, uh, Destiny, this question about uh, panelinic recruitment, um, do you wanna just answer that one on um, like out loud? Sure. Okay, so for the formal panhellenic recruitment process, um, yes, there is an orientation session that will be happening on January 5th. So the process does begin prior to the start of the spring semester. So there will be an orientation session that is mandatory for all potential new members to attend that evening at 5.30 p.m. Obviously, we know that sometimes Flights are booked in advance of knowing that information, and so that's totally fine. If you have a student who is unable to attend that session, not only we will send will we send out the slides after the fact, but also your student will be paired with a recruitment counselor who can share any additional updates, as well as getting in touch with our office. 
And then the first round of recruitment will begin at 9 a.m. on Saturday, January 6th, and will run pretty much that entire day. And then we will have the second round, which is the first invitational round that will happen on January 7th, that Sunday. And then we will take a break for the first week of class, and then we will resume recruitment activities the following Friday afternoon, so Friday, January 12th. And then we will have events the 12th, the 13th, and then we will end with their bid day, which is the day that they would hopefully, if they've made it to the end of the process, find out which organization that they have been invited to join. And so again, to address this question, there are four different rounds of recruitment. The first is the only round during which a student is guaranteed to meet with all nine of our participating organizations. And then the remaining rounds are by invitation only, meaning that our students who are participating have to say which organizations that they would like to go back to. And those organizations hopefully have invited those students back. And then that is what generates their schedules of invitations for the remainder of the rounds. It's really important to note that even though there's a maximum number of organizations that a student could visit each of those rounds, there is no guarantee that that student will receive the maximum number of invitations. And so we can also make available to you all a schedule that's detailed of what the recruitment process looks like for Panhellenic recruitment, because that will take a little bit longer to walk through than time that we have this morning. But hopefully that answers those initial questions for folks. Um, okay, so just want to clarify. So the, what Destiny was just describing was for the Panhellenic. Um, and so the Panhellenic recruitment process is, is their bid day is on January 14th. Um, the IFC bid day is on January 13th. And PHC, as Kayla talked about, all of the organizations operate on different timelines. So I can't give you like the, this is when um, that would take place for each individual organization. Um, and so I'm just trying to look at like some of these questions that we have in there. Um, uh, so hopefully that will, hopefully that clarifies some of those things about the difference. So um, yeah, so if you, you have a child who's joining an IFC organization, it's fine that you're not coming back until afterwards. So um, that's okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna answer um, a couple other questions um, that we're gonna have the students answer, answer from in a panel perspective um, about uh, about for for the group. So, um, Kayla, can you talk to us a little bit about how you balance time within Greek life classes and activities? Yes. So, in addition to me serving as the president of National Panhellenic Council, I also serve as vice president of the Black Cultural Center and hold several executive positions in my chapter. So it can be a little hectic sometimes, but I really think just staying organized, delegating, and communicating my needs have really helped me throughout this whole process. Especially before I took on the presidency, I was holding executive positions in my chapter. So that's kind of where I learned. But staying organized looks like filling out my Google Calendar and really just seeing what my look, week looks like visually helps me to be like, okay, Tuesday's going to be a hard day for me. So I need to reach out to my exec to see if they can or delivering on their action items that I gave them or can attend a meeting in my place, that kind of thing. So really leaning on the people that I have close to me in my community and then communicating like, okay, I saw one of the questions about lab. So as a pre-med, I definitely understand that whole situation. So if I like had lab or class or needed to go to office hours or something, really just making sure that I um, am communicating my needs and that I have time conflicts and really just yeah, staying organized, delegating, and communicating has really helped me balance it all. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Jack, what would you say makes our Greek community unique and special? Um, I would say that the people within Greek life itself is what kind of contributes to that at Vanderbilt. I'd say that there's no specific mold for what a fraternity or sorority member at Vanderbilt looks like, and I think that speaks a lot to both the population we have at Vanderbilt, but also the way we recruit and try and reach all sorts of different areas of campus to get students who have different levels of um, kind of interest and familiarity with Greek life, the ability to kind of meet our chapters and get to know what joining Greek life could be like and get a really positive experience out of that. Um, I think like something very interesting about a lot of our chapters is that our individual members are not just members of their own chapters, they're usually a member of their chapter and something else, whether that's a pre-professional society, another club, a sport, 
whatever that might be, you'll find at Vanderbilt, a lot of people in our Greek life community are involved in leaders in a lot of different areas on campus. So I think that's something really positive that this, it's a very holistic engagement at Tricuther Wise. It's not just that students are a sorority or fraternity member and that's their only involvement. And I think that's something really special. Awesome. Um, okay, so Madison, this was a question that was specifically asked in advance. How do you feel like the, the VU Greek community promotes inclusivity and belonging? Yeah, so I think something that has been one of the most rewarding parts of my experience in Greek life is that relative to other schools, I think Vanderbilt places a really heavy emphasis on promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion through Greek life. And so whether that be internal to my chapter, participating in conversations surrounding inclusivity in Greek life, or participating in things like Ignite VU, which is our Greek-wide initiative, they've created spaces where we can really think critically about how we're creating sp like spaces of true inclusivity and belonging for everybody. Um, and I could say in my personal experience, being in Greek life has really filled my life with very empowering people who have given me a space to belong within the larger Vanderbilt community. So I think that kind of folding in, like we both have this really strong emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion. But as Jack was saying, we also just have like wonderful people in this community who really do foster spaces of where you can feel like you could bring your whole self. Awesome. Okay. And so this, this last question is for all three of you. Can you um, share with the parents, what is one, uh, one is the most important thing that you've learned from being a member of the fraternity and sorority community? Um, what, yeah. What is the most important thing that you've learned? I um, can go. Oh, oh, go ahead, Kayla. Go ahead. Sorry. I think I've learned how to find community in every space I go, especially like at within Vanderbilt's Greek community and all the things that the Office of Greek Life fosters. It's really allowed me to see that find commonalities between people and really learn how to grow in my strength as being kind of a people person and finding someone that I can connect with in multiple spaces. And I've carried that into like my internships and my volunteering spaces and especially like national Panhellenic organizations really do place an emphasis on that we're international organizations. So there will be someone that you can connect to everywhere you go. And this community has really helped me foster and grow in that strength. Great. Um, I was going to say uh, re relatively similar. I think the kind of ability to both lean on others and have the sense of kind of mentorship with um, older, younger brothers I know in my chapter as well. Um, and this is both like socially as friends and also professionally as well. Um, I think within our own chapters, you can find a really strong sense of community and trust um, among everyone there. And I, th I think that's something that... Um, has been kind of integral to my college experience and being a member of my chapter has provided. So I, I think that's something really special about um, all of our chapters and it's something I really value. Yeah, kind of piggybacking off of Jack's answer, I think from being a member in Greek life, one of the biggest things I've learned is like how to be a really great friend. I think seeing the people around me model like true friendship and, you know, if I'm having a bad day, having friends who will drop anything they're doing to come and like support me and uplift me has kind of taught me like what I value in friendships and like pushed me to bring that back into my friendships and give that same energy to everyone else that I engage with. Um, and then also from being a leader in Greek life, I think one of the greatest things I've learned is like how to be confident in my abilities. And I think any one of the council presidents could tell you like when you're doing these kind of jobs, you do hard things. And that's like a really empowering thing that I'll take into any future careers that I can do challenging things. I can navigate difficult situations. Um, and be really confident in my leadership abilities in that. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, thank you, students. Um, okay. Wanted to offer some, uh, as we're approaching the end of our time together, a little bit of advice for parents. Um, you should encourage your student to get involved and meet many people at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is an awesome place. Greek life is an amazing opportunity for students to make connections, but it's definitely not the only one here. So um, when we talk about like keeping an open mind, Greek life is not for everybody. Um, just because it might be, uh, you might have been in a fraternity or sorority, it doesn't mean it's the right choice for your child. Um, students need your support throughout the recruitment and, and intake process in a new member education. Being supportive and asking questions and listening to their answers is, is the best practice. Um, 
acknowledging that fraternities and sororities are different on every campus. So groups that might be strong on a campus where you attended school or might not, they might not have the same reputation at Vanderbilt. So let your student choose the group that they're most comfortable joining. Sometimes we have students that, um, you know, it can become really challenging when the student wants to make a different decision than their parent or their sister or their grandmother um, made. And, um, you know, so just being willing to um, have the openness to like the, what is the best, what is in the best interest for your child at this time might be different than the, than the choice that you made, um, or other members in your family made, um, when, when they were in school. Um, talk to your student beforehand about the financial obligation. So Destiny went through the slide that talked about, you know, the financial obligations of membership and the information that we have that is available on our website to try to, you know, like outline for folks, you know, what some of those things are, but making sure that you talk with your student about that. Um, you know, I have a, my stepdaughter is getting ready to go to college. And so like us talking with her about saying like, okay, Ellie Kate, like this is going to be what we can contribute. And these are going to be the things that you're going to need to be able to pay for, um, is an important conversation so that everybody can be on the same page of knowing like, like whose obligation is this? And, you, you know, so that they're making um, educated decisions about, you know, what what can they afford and what does make sense? Or is this something they can do at this time? Is it something that they need, you know, that we're just really clear on that so that no one is kind of surprised about um, that those financial obligations? Um, no, I mean, being like we want to be in a transparent conversation of knowing that for training and security recruitment at Vanderbilt is can be competitive. Not everybody who wants to be Greek at Vanderbilt is going to receive an invitation for membership. Um, it is our aim that we want to do our best to make sure that students who keep an open mind, um, that would be the, the thing that I would tell everybody, if the student keeps an open mind, they are very likely going to be very successful in our recruitment process. But students who have tunnel vision and say like, I am the best and I only want to be in whatever I have defined as the best, um, or their parent has defined as the best can be very difficult for that to sometimes um, be in the reality of like that this is not going to work out, um, uh, you know, for for them if it doesn't turn out exactly the way that they had anticipated. Um, but we do have, I will say, like our in terms of the people who have registered for recruitment and the people who end up receiving bids, um, uh, a pretty high uh, retention rate in our processes, um, certainly compared to um, our peers and other folks. Um, don't become overly involved in your student's decision, uh, in, in their recruitment process, in that like it is their decision. So like um, making sure that you're allowing that space for like, yes, we want you to be there to help ask questions and those kind of things, but but um, not so involved that like they don't feel like that they can be making their own choice. Um, too often parents don't allow students to fight their own battles. Um, it helps students to mature and gain some assertiveness and some perspective when they are allowed to kind of, how to they navigate, how do they navigate things at Vanderbilt instead of um, the parents always being the one to do those things um, um, on their behalf. Uh, there's a lot of great resources here. We are here to help. Um, and I would encourage you to really think about like, how can you, how can you be the one who helps your student to think about, do, do, are you the one who needs to make the phone call or can they help to make the, can they make the phone call themselves? Sometimes it is you. Sometimes the parent does need to be the one who can help make that phone call on their behalf. But sometimes um, that student making that, that make going to the student center for well-being on their own is a good step for them to make and shows um, great maturity on their part. And um, you will be proud of them as a parent for being able to make, make some of those choices on their own um, and, and showing that self-advocacy for themselves. Um, so, those are some of the pieces, like, as I think when I've talked to parents over the years, some of the things that they've seen, like, um, that they either wish they would have done differently or wish they would have had a conversation about, like, like the thing about the money, like making sure that they'd asked about that in advance or, you know, making sure that they, um, they hadn't pressured their student as much. So, um, some of this advice is advice that, that parents have said to me kind of for after, after that they realized later on. So, um, we, I think we've answered all of the questions here in the chat today. Um, we will make sure, um, up on here, this is our team. This is my whole, um, our office of Greek life team. Um, and we are here to answer questions for you, um, at any time. Um, I will, 
work with the parent and family office to make sure that everybody gets the link to our website and that we can send out the slides so that everybody has the things that they need. Um, um, but if you need anything, please let us know and visit our website for the dates and details of um, any of the other things that you might need um, to be successful. So thank you very much for joining us here today. Students, great job. Thanks for um, all of your work and partnership with us. Thank you.